Hi, this is Dr. Antherica Lane with another episode of Conversations with Dr. Lane. Today, we're going to talk to Dr. Chris Ram Prasad and Karen Lampion. They both work in the field of gastroenterology. We are going to talk about colonoscopies, colon cancer. We'll even talk a little bit about colon cleansing and constipation. This should be a really interesting show, believe it or not. Here we go. Hello, this is Dr. Antherica Lane with Conversations with Dr. Lane. Today, we are talking about colonoscopy, colon cancer, and gastroenterology. I am pleased to introduce our guest for today. First, we have Karen Bozeman Lampkin. Karen Bozeman Lampkin is currently a registered nurse and assistant nurse manager at the Cincinnati VA Medical Center Gastroenterology Lab. She has many years of experience in nursing, particularly in long-term care, telemetry, med surge, endoscopy, and home health care case management. Next, we have Dr. Chris Ram Prasad. Dr. Ram Prasad is an associate professor at University of Cincinnati in the Department of Internal Medicine Gastroenterology. He graduated from Madras Medical College in Madras, India. He completed his residency in internal medicine at Wright State University and a fellowship in gastroenterology at University of Cincinnati. He is an award-winning physician that has served on the medical staff of the VA Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. He has held numerous leadership positions as a physician throughout his career. In 2014, he served as the president of the Ohio State Medical Board. He has also been named top doctor by Cincinnati Magazine. Dr. Ram Prasad has also received an Excellence in Clinical Teaching Award at the University of Cincinnati in 2014, 2015, and 2018. Welcome, Karen and Dr. Ram Prasad. Thank you so much for participating in my show today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to get right to our questions today. Dr. Ram Prasad, so many people may not even realize what gastroenterology is. That's a big word that may sound confusing to many people. What exactly is gastroenterology? And can you just please explain the field of gastroenterology? Gastroenterology is a fairly big field. Um, it starts with the problems with swallowing from the very top. Uh, through the food pipe called the esophagus to the stomach to the small bowel to the colon and in between problems dealing with the liver and the pancreas. Um, they can have jaundice, gallbladder stones, gallbladder problems, cancers of the pancreas, cancers of different organs and bleeding um, and ulcers, a uh, problem with food getting stuck and so uh, there is wild where variety of things that we have that we deal with every day. So how does one actually become a gastroenterologist? Um, first and foremost, after medical school, everybody has to do a residency. Usually this is done in internal medicine for three years. And then you get trained in gastroenterology for three more years, sometimes for four years, depending on your interest in research, liver, or other organs, or other diseases. So it's about seven years after leaving medical school, and you get trained in various different things, including procedures and dealing with diseases, et cetera. When should someone see a gastroenterologist as opposed to their primary care physician? Most often, we encourage people to go through their primary care physician. There are very few circumstances where we want to uh, supplant what primary care doctors do. But once they come to us, like inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or they do have constant problems with swallowing or jaundice or a complicated case of hepatitis or 
something to do with chronic pancreatitis, which results from alcohol consumption and things like that, then we would continue to follow the patient with the primary care doctors. So let's start with the basics. It's really important that we educate everyone on their anatomy. Let's talk about the difference between the anus, the rectum, the colon, and intestines. Um, if, if we can go to our slide there, um, I do have a um, hand-drawn picture. So if you see down there <clears throat> on the left, on the um, right side, it looks like an inverted U. In fact, there are several turns in it. And the very bottom on the right side is the anal opening. And then you have the rectum. Yes, you have the pointer. And then beyond the rectum, it becomes the colon. We call it descending colon, splenic flexure. And then we have the transverse colon going across. And then again, down on the right side of our body towards the appendix. It's called the cecum. And then the squiggle I have from there to the, right, to the right of it is the small bowel, which is about 30 some feet packed into the belly. But large bowel is called the colon. And this is primarily the picture of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram Prasad, for explaining our anatomy. I think it's really important that we really have a great understanding of where we're actually talking about and where your specialty uh, really governs. So thank you for that. So um, according to the CDC, colorectal cancer or colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer in the United States. Karen, what are the risk factors for colon cancer? So some of the risk factors that increase your chances of developing colon cancer are listed on the slide. Um, colon cancer um, typically occurs in people age 50 or greater. So age is a factor um, increasing the risk for developing colon cancer. Um, having someone in your family that ha that's had colorectal cancer or colorectal polyps, a, per a personal history of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Also, um, there's a syndrome, Lynch syndrome, which is an inherited defective gene that increases one's risk for developing colorectal cancer, typically at an age younger than 50. Some other um, factors that increase your risk of developing colon cancer are some lifestyle factors, such as being overweight or obese, lack of physical activity, alcohol consumption and smoking, as well as having a diet consisting of high fat foods and lacking fresh fruits and vegetables. So I find that to be quite interesting that with colon cancer, there's a genetic component, but there's also a lifestyle component. I think that's really important to begin to understand those medical conditions that have factors that as patients that we can individually control. Dr. Ram Prasad, um, there are many sources that discuss that African Americans are disproportionately affected by colon cancer. Why is this? And are the screening guidelines any different for African Americans? Um, yes, the screening guidelines are somewhat different, not dramatically. We'd like to start screening African Americans uh, at age 45 because there is some indication that the African-Americans are affected earlier in their age group than any other uh, group. The um, question they asked as to why it's worse an outcome in African-Americans is not well answered, even though people have looked at it. Um, as um, Nurse Karen had shown in the previous slide, there are so many genetic predisposing, predisposing factors involved, uh, like the genes and et cetera, 
but they have also looked at the genes are common for every race group. There's, there may be some little changes, but most of us are affected the same way as far as genes are concerned and genes affecting colon cancer. But when the other factors that you took into consideration, you uh, take smoking, for example, smoking does make colon cancers more prevalent. Um, but from what I see from uh, CDC and the federal government, the number of people who are African Americans who smoke is not as high as Caucasians, but yet they have worse outcome when they smoke. Um, the other factor people have looked at is obesity. Other than um, African American women, the men are not really overweight compared to Caucasians, and it doesn't seem to be a factor in African-Americans. Diet may be a, a factor because the diet changes the bacteria that's in the bowel, and certain bacteria like Fusobacterium certainly causes ca cancers in any number of people. And they compared, one study compared people in South Africa with the people here living in the United States and same sort of ethnic groups and change the diets and they could see changes in the bacteria in the bowel. So like um, nurse Karen Pat pointed out, the diet with better uh, fruits, vegetables, and things about that sort uh, may be beneficial and not uh, red meat, things of that sort. These are not uh, really um, nailed down, but we certainly think that uh, that plays a role. Beyond that, for reasons unclear, once the African Americans get cancer, they seem to do worse than any other group, whether it's Hispanics or Caucasians or Asians, um, and particularly on the right side of the colon, and no one seems to know exactly why this is happening. You can, it's not like socioeconomic status. It's not because they're coming to the doctors late. It does happen that they come back to late if they don't have insurance, but even taken into consideration which stage of cancer they are in, they seem to have a little bit more difficulty with chemotherapy and outcome is not as good. So preventing cancer is the primary answer to this. Dr. Ram Prasad, what are the signs of colon cancer? How would I know if, if this should be a concern for me? Um, if you have change in bowel habit, they have rectal bleeding, um, symptoms that one did not have before related to the bowel may be a consideration, but these are not specific. In other words, just because you have some rectal bleeding, it doesn't pinpoint it's cancer, no, but it is the best thing to get it checked. But rectal bleeding can be from any number of different things. Could be from inflammation of the bowel, it could be from having hemorrhoids, uh, any number of different things. You can even have from ulcers. Uh, but once you have bleeding and you are in that age group beyond 40, you may want to get to your doctor and get it checked. Uh, to recap, bleeding seems to be a primary sign of colon cancer. Or you could become anemic because chronically sometimes you just slowly lose blood mm. and don't assume it's from something else. Just make sure that the proper tests are done when you're low in iron, uh, low in blood count. Nurse Karen, I'd like us to review when should a person have a colonoscopy? So the first colonoscopy is typically recommended at the age of 50, unless you have a family history of colon cancer, like a parent, sibling, or a child. Um, it may be recommended that you have a colonoscopy earlier than the age of 50. Um, your doctor may also recommend a colonoscopy if you're experiencing a change in bowel pattern um, having blood in your stool, you feel like your bowels aren't completely emptying after a bowel movement, persistent cramps or gas, weight loss, pencil thin stools, weakness and fatigue. Um, if you're experiencing these things, the doctor may uh, 
look at this as an indication for further evaluation by colonoscopy. So I find that interesting, Karen, pencil thin stools. Dr. Ram Prasad, why would there be pencil thin stools? Um, it is not a very specific finding. For that to happen, the um, tumor has to be right in the rectum and the stool has to be very soft. It's almost like you're pressing a putty through a small area. This is not a common thing and uh, we rarely, rarely see it, but when you see it, you certainly should have your physician check you for it. it but I want to insist that it's not specific for cancer alone. It may be just because the stools have gotten smaller and somebody is straining, and it may just kind of come out like pencil-like. So, Karen, how do we actually screen for colon cancer? So the gold standard is to have a traditional colonoscopy. Um, but there are some other methods that are used for screening, such as fecal occult blood testing, which checks for, che takes a sample of stool and they check for blood in the stool. There's also um, CT colonoscopy, which is utilizing an X-ray to analyze the um, colon. Um, another test that's used is called a fecal immunochemical test or FIT test using antibodies to detect blood in the stool. And there's also a FIT DNA test that's used. And this is basically the FIT test and a, D and a second test, which looks for um, cancerous DNA in the stool. And that's typically done anywhere from one to every, one to every three years. Um, for that test. But again, if there's any findings on these other tests, they still, a, a person would still need to have a traditional colonoscopy done. That would be the only way you could remove polyps as well. Dr. Ram Prasad, in the past we often did digital rectal exams. Why isn't the digital rectal exam sufficient to screen for colon cancer? As I uh, showed in the previous picture, the colon is about four or five feet long. And in particular, in African Americans, we think that there is more disease further inside with the colon polyps, which when we remove, we avoid someone having colon cancer. Or when we discover colon cancers on the right side, the rectal cancers also occur in the rectum, which many times can be felt with the rectal uh, examination, but that's not adequate enough. None of the tests, none of the tests that have been done in Europe, in several countries, and in the United States have shown rectal examination alone is uh, enough to prevent someone from having cancer or detecting the cancer. So it will have to have further some tests done, like Nurse Karen pointed out, the options that we have is important to have it. Even when you have a rectal exam and test it for the blood, like the occult test or the FIT test that uh, Nurse Karen mentioned, they're not specific and they're not as good as getting from the stool specimens. So it's okay to do the rectal exam, but they're not the best to identify colon cancers. So let's talk a little bit more about colonoscopy. Uh, nurse Karen, from a nursing perspective, please walk me through the steps leading up to the colonoscopy when the patient arrives to the surgical facility. Well, prior to the patient arriving to the facility to have a colonoscopy, the patient will have had to take a bowel prep um, to ensure that the colon is clean and the endoscopist can uh, examine the lining of the colon wall. Uh, the patient also, prior to that, there has to be a determination what type of sedation medications are required so that the patient can be comfortable during the procedure. Patients may also require uh, cardiac clearance to have a procedure done because we are using um, sedation medications. The day before colonoscopy, while the patient is taking the bowel prep to clear the colon, they also need to maintain a clear liquid diet. 
So these are some of the steps that have to happen prior to the patient um, arriving to the facility to have their colonoscopy performed. Now, once the patient actually arrives at the facility, what happens after they are checked in in preparation for the actual procedure? Once the patient arrives and they're checked in, uh, there also has to be a verification that they have a responsible person with them because they are going to receive medication uh, for, for sedation purposes. Uh, we bring the patient into the unit and we uh, start the pre-op portion. And the pre-op portion involves doing an assessment, a nursing assessment, as well as an assessment is performed by the physician. The patient also has to give consent for us to proceed with the procedure. We start a small IV, as well as we put the patient on the monitor in order to monitor their vital signs. And that monitoring vital signs will continue not only in the pre-op phase, but also intraoperatively and postoperatively until the patient is discharged. Okay, so now we're at the point where we're ready for a colonoscopy. Dr. Ram Prasad, can you please explain what happens during the colonoscopy after the patient is sedated? Um, we insert a uh, very flexible tube about the size of my thumb or a little smaller. They have light going through it with actual images onto a TV, uh, TV screen. So we are able to watch and see. Importantly, there is no feeling inside the colon. So even if we touch the wall, no one can feel it. Even if they are awake, it's not like the skin. So we do go around the colon to the area where the appendix is, looking for um, areas of um, what appears to be like a peanut or a little larger or smaller, uh, which are all polyps, which we like to remove during that procedure, either with cautery or by just pinching it with a snare, which is a wire laso that we can put around the polyp and pinch it and it comes off. Um, it's not painful and it shouldn't take more than about 20 minutes to do the study, whole study. So this is just a diagram of a polyp. The one on our left is a polyp with a little stalk, like a flower having a stalk. And we can remove it by catching it and cauterizing it, it comes off. The one on the right, is fairly flat and we call it sessile. And we can also remove them most of the time without any problems. That's a type of thing in, in the picture that, that you see here. In the next slide, you will see the actual pictures of these polyps. One on top on the left side is one says IP on top is a polyp with a stalk and the other one next to it on the right um, is, is not as flat, and it is a, a sessile, which is also a polyp with a short stalk, and the one next to it is a very flat polyp. And in the bottom, they're very, very flat. They do look different. Um, that one is a polyp, and that one is a very, we call it as a granular polyp. And the one on the very right, even though it looks kind of bald, it may be more advanced a polyp, which may be getting ready to get into cancer. So these are the things that we look when we are actually doing uh, colonoscopy to look for those things, in addition to other diseases, obviously. And to remove them, this is a cartoon picture. The round um, big one looks like a cigarette. That's the colonoscope. And there is a catheter comes out of it, and then a wire comes out of it, which is what we call it's a snare. And the three pictures on the right side shows how we grab the polyp, yep, and we tighten it and burn it, and the polyp comes off. Um, so this is a right technique of doing it. And again, there's no um, sensation there, and it's easily done, takes no more than a few seconds to do it. So Nurse Karen, how often do patients really complain of pain after this type of, of procedure? 
Well, there's not a, a set number for how many typically have pain. Uh, the pain is, is typically related to gas that they need to expel because during the procedure, air is instilled into the colon to inflate it to help the endoscopist visualize the lining of the colon. So sometimes that air can get trapped and the patient needs to release that air. And once they've released that air, typically there's no pain. Dr. Ron Prasad, uh, I have many patients that have expressed a fear regarding the complications related to colonoscopy. Can you speak to some of those complications and how often do they actually occur? Um, properly done colonoscopy very rarely ends up in any complications. One of the commonest things we see is like I showed you how to remove a polyp, either because they're on blood thinners or when we cauterize later on, there forms an ulcer or sore. Patients can bleed from it, but we can go in and take care of it if they do ha have it. Apart from that, there are risks of perforation where you dig a hole through the wall. And this is pretty rare, but has been known to happen. Um, I have been doing this for nearly 39, 40 years, and luckily, touch wood, I've not had a single patient who perforate. So it's not like I am the best in the world, but uh, it is fairly, uh, just to tell you that it's fairly safe to do. Uh, most physicians have the same record as I do, but it, unfortunately, sometimes colons are very difficult. They twist around and may be difficult and these things do happen. But again, very rare for that to happen. So if you were to sum up the benefits of having a colonoscopy, what would you say? It's certainly uh, a fairly safe uh, test to do. And the results of avoiding cancer, particularly we're talking about African-Americans ending up with fairly significant problems and not responding to chemotherapy as well as other groups, knowing that the cancer is more advanced sometimes, more aggressive sometimes, and it's deeper on the right side of the colon, doing a colonoscopy is life-saving. It avoids lots and lots of problems, lots and lots of expenditure, lots and lots of grief, and a lot of saving for the family mm -hmm. from having problems. And not only to mention that how healthy you can be just taking care of a polyp before even grows into a cancer. I wanted to finish up our conversation talking about a common problem that we see in gynecology that can contribute to pelvic pain, and that is something as simple as constipation. Why do so many patients struggle with constipation? Um, it all depends on, um, um, it could be as simple as diet related. Um, walking and taking water kind of stuff has repeatedly been shown not to be helpful. What is helpful is fiber, like a soluble fiber, like psyllium, which is in the Metamucil. There are other products which have them too. Not uh, a hard brand kind of stuff, but simple vegetables, uh, even prunes kind of stuff might help. Apart from that, some of them have uh, difficulty with coordinating muscles in the rectum and the anal area. In other words, the rectum has to push when we are ready to have a bowel movement, and the anal opening has to open. In some people, these don't happen in an organized fashion. We can do some tests to see how it works, and they can have something called biofeedback from physiotherapists, and it certainly helps. There are people who don't uh, have good function of the bowel, uh, that is the large colon, and that could be a problem also. Two other additional things, some people have irritable bowel syndrome, part of it may have constipation, um, and some people have diarrhea, some people have constipation and diarrhea, but when you have constipation and abdominal pain, then we usually think about irritable bowel syndrome. And typically when you have irritable bowel syndrome, when you have a bowel movement, the pain is gone. The other group is people since their childhood, 
or even when they're teenage years, may have had a traumatic event or may not have had opportunity to have a bathroom, things like that in underdeveloped countries and things of that sort. And they do develop this habit of retaining stool and have constipation. Uh, in your field of gynecology, we see people after having had hysterectomy, things of that sort, we think it's because of the musculature in the pelvic area, but it is so complicated as you know, um, in that area, we, we don't exactly know what, it, what all is going on, but certainly we see people after certain surgeries have problem with bowel movements. Lastly, what are your thoughts about colon cleansing? Uh, colon cleansing as a, a therapeutic maneuver has never proven to be of any benefit. Um, there is uh, no certain cultures will always ask uh, people to take laxatives on a regular basis once a month, something like that. But there has not been any proof so far uh, for that, but I would uh, call and cleanse in a regular way where you pay for it and get it done, things of that sort have never proven to be of any benefit. Well, okay, you heard it here on Conversations with Dr. Lane. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram Prasad. Thank you so much, Nurse Karen Bozeman Lampkin, for our wonderful conversation today. We talked about gastroenterology, we talked about colon cancer, colonoscopy, and we finished it up with constipation and colon cleansing. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Antherica Lane with Conversations with Dr. Lane. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Thank you, Dr. Lane.